a 5-1 and one homestand, a lot of good things to pull from six games in the second half at American Family Field. Things got rowdy. Corbin Burns was Corbin Burns. Happy flight, happy off day today as the Brewers get ready to take on the Red Sox in very good timing. And a former Red Sox made some headlines late last night. Don't go anywhere. You're locked on. You are locked on Brewers. Your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Good morning. Thanks for making Locked On Brewers your first listen of the day. I'm Dominic Catronio. This is your only daily podcast dedicated to the Brewers all season long. If you haven't already, subscribe. Tell your friends. We're on YouTube as well. Right here, wherever you get your podcasts. Two, of course, the video version of our pods are posted on YouTube. And uh, we got a lot to get into today. Not just a big 10-4 to victory for the Brewers yesterday. They sweep the two-game border battle. They take three out of four from the Twins. And more on how that was almost even better than that in a second. Uh, You're also going to talk about the hot stove. It's officially hot. Trade deadline is on Tuesday at 5 o'clock Central Time. So it's getting real now. You know, trades are happening. And a big one happened last night. Maybe you were already getting ready for bed and missed it. So big trade happened yesterday in baseball. More on that a little bit later. We're going to look at the outfield market. Briefly touch on the upcoming weekend rotation in Boston. Uh, We're going to look at some overall numbers here, too. We're going to gush about Corbin Burns, of course, as well. Uh, First and foremost, though, 10-4. to Quick recap of the game yesterday. Rowdy Telez happened. What a day for Rowdy. He needed that to get the monkey off of his back. It's been a slow July for him. Remember, he had the epic games against Toronto, those last two games he had against his former team against the Blue Jays. He had the two-homer game against them. Uh, Then he really cooled off in the early part of July and hasn't really been himself as of late. He hits two home runs. It's his ninth career multi-homer game for him and his fourth this season. He has been huge for the Brewers. Came at a perfect time as well. Both of the homers, three-run shots for him. The game was on YouTube yesterday, and they give out a player of the game award for every game that they do. And undoubtedly, it was Rowdy Telez for hitting those two homers. And a cool side moment uh, working that game yesterday. So Amy Gutierrez, if you don't know, a.k.a. Amy G., uh, is the sideline reporter for the San Francisco Giants. You know, their Sophia Minner, if you will. And Amy G. was working the game for YouTube yesterday. She was their dugout sideline reporter uh, for the game yesterday. Of course, we've documented the fact that Rowdy grew up a huge Giants fan growing up in Sacramento in Northern California. And Rowdy got a chance to talk to Amy G. back in San Francisco when the Brewers faced them last, uh, right before the All-Star break. And he admitted in the post-game interview yesterday that he was a bit starstruck when he met Amy G. because he grew up watching her. And as you would expect, Amy G. didn't like that sentence saying, wait a minute, you're 27 years old and you say you grew up watching me. That doesn't make her feel great. But it was cool because after Rowdy's first home run, he goes to ring the happy hour bell, as we've seen the home run tradition, and looks straight to Amy G. sitting in the first base camera well. Says, that was for you. That was a cool moment. And then he did the same thing on his second home run. They talked about it. They hugged it out after the game. That was a cool little fun moment of baseball because, man, think about that, right? Like, if you're if you're listening right now and you're watching Sophia Minnett do the games right now and you're a high school baseball player or you're a college baseball player and one day you go and hit bombs, maybe through the Brewers, maybe Sophia's doing a national game or something, and you hit a bomb that Sophia's working, and you'd be like, man, like, I grew up watching you do the quick trip to the clubhouse. You know, it's like, that's a cool moment. Think about that. That's, that's, that's very fun for Rowdy to experience that. And that was very, very fun for him. Uh, otherwise, in this game, so he had six of the 10 runs batted in in this game. It was very sustainable offense once again for the Brewers. However, Luis Urias did add a two-run homer in this game. A ton of walks. 10 walks drawn by the Brewers. That is a season high. A lot of that thanks in part to Chris Archer not quite being in form. Uh, It was a quiet day for Hunter Renfro. He kind of carried the team on his back this past week anyway. Uh, RBIs, of course, belong to Rowdy Telez. Christian Yelich had an RBI. Willie Adamas had a sack fly. uh, And Luis Arias with the two-run home run as well. So the Brewers, they win the two games. They're now 55-44, and still in first place. The Cardinals won yesterday. So that's a split in Toronto for them. The Brewers are still three games up on the Cardinals moving forward in the schedule. When you look at this border battle series this past two weeks or so, the Brewers were one Josh Hader meltdown away from sweeping all four games 
against a first place team in the Minnesota Twins. And they still won three out of four from a first place team in the Minnesota Twins. And before you say, oh, well, Dom, the AL Central is kind of crap. Well, the NL Central ain't great either. But look, it's still a first place team. Byron Buxton, Carlos Correa are still in that lineup. Luis Arise is the best hitter in baseball that nobody talks about. They have a, a closer that throws 102 miles an hour in Yohan Duran. They're a legit team. They're going to be a playoff team. Will they beat the Yankees? I don't know. That's a good series win, taking three out of four from the Twins. You can't be, oh, everything's bad, everything's brutal, roosting. No, they just took three out of four from a first-place team. Recognize that. Admire that. Own that and be proud of that. Because that's going to be something that you're looking at the end of the year saying, okay, hey, they took three out of four from the Twins. Maybe this is the series, and the offense specifically, that gets them going, that gets them back into the right direction, keeps things moving as it's supposed to. Because as we said, 99 games are down. It's, we're about to hit 100 games on Friday in. It's real now. I mean, you're in the final stretch, two months to go in essence from here to the end of the year because you're going to play into the second week of October for the regular season because of the lockout. And it, it's real now. I mean, a trade just happened. The Brewers have urgency behind them. They're getting healthier with... Justin Topa on the rehab assignment, Luis Perdomo on a rehab assignment. Uh, You've also, of course, got Freddie Peralta and Adrian Hauser on their way back this coming up this month. The Brewers are adding without needing to get trades, and I think that's very exciting for the Brewers right now as they are still 55 and 44, keeping things moving in the right direction. 95 wins last year, and of course, with 62 games to go. To win 40 of your last 62, that would be pretty insane, but not saying it can't be done. Uh, but it, that's something maybe the Brewers are going to strive for. Pass 90 wins and see what happens after that. Because I think the, the division's won right around 92 wins here in the, in the NL Central this year. We'll see what happens in that regard. Let's talk about some series notes. Let's talk about Corbin Burns. Uh, and we're going to get into the trade in just a little bit as well. Before we do that, I want to talk about the Sports Card Investor app. If you're just a casual hobbyist and maybe got some baseball cards sitting in your closet right now, or if you're locked in and you're all about making it a side hustle of selling sports cards, you have to make sure you have the Sports Card Investor app on your phone. It's completely free and available on both the Google Play and Apple App Store as well. You can find great deals. You can find the value of your cards that are sitting in your in your room right now. And you can browse over 600,000 cards with their 7-day or 30-day charts. And even furthermore, you can just buy it directly through the app if there's a card that catches your eye. Thanks to their eBay Deals feature, you can find breakout stars debuting. I mean, I'm sure an Adley Rutschman card is looking really good right now with what the Orioles got going on. Or a Fernando Tatis rookie card with the White Sox. Or, of course, you can go back in time. If you got an old Robin Young, if you got an old Paul Molitor, you can see what that's worth as well on the Sports Card Investor app, and maybe you can make a little side change out of it. Download the Sports Card Investor app today, available for free, again, Apple App Store or Google Play, or you can go to sportscardinvestor.com slash locked on. Quick trivia question. Who do you think was the had who do you think had the best batting average during this homestand coming off of the uh, all-star break? If your instant reaction was Hunter Renfro, you're wrong. Uh, what if you think, oh, maybe it's Christian Yelich? You're wrong. The answer, and this surprised me too, Colton Wong had the best homestand of any brewer as far as batting average and kind of getting on base. He went 9 for 21 at the plate with a 500 on base percentage, a 429 batting average. Colton Wong heating up the big clutch home run on Monday night against the Rockies. Uh, he's Starting to heat back up. He's been playing really well since he was activated from the injured list. Looking forward to see what Wong can produce. Yelich had a great home stand as well. He went 7 for 23. He had a 304 average, a 467 on base. Uh, he drew three walks yesterday, scored a run, also had a base hit. And I want to play this audio here in just a second of what Christian Yelich was saying while he was mic'd up on YouTube uh, for their game. He caught up with Carlos Correa pregame. Remember, I tweeted this at Dom underscore Catronio comparing his swing from Tuesday night into his swing from Saturday night, a swing and miss from Saturday night, and a double from Tuesday night that he was using a toe tap. And uh, take a listen to what Christian had to say. I tried a toe tap yesterday for the first time. Yeah? First time ever. I feel like recognizing pitches is a little tougher. It's like timing is different, so you got to get used to it. Now we got to be efficient because they throw so hard, bro. That's why I did it because my... 
this body wasn't moving the same, like my load and all that. So I, was like, I just got to make this simpler and see what we can do. So Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's going to stick around, but he's going to see if he uses it this weekend uh, with the Green Monster in uh, Fenway Park. That was a terrible Boston accent. I apologize. And lastly, of course, Hunter Renfro had a great series. We all, you already knew that. He slugged 760 for this homestand, 7 for 25 at the plate, even despite going 0 for 5 at the plate yesterday. And in the handshake line, uh, Hunter Renfro, it was caught on the hot mic from Christian Yelich yesterday as they all uh, made high fives and... Uh, Renfro came over and said, hey, uh, good job, guys. Sorry I didn't bring anything. And Yelich goes, yeah, thanks for nothing, Renfro. Hey, you carried us all weekend. That was a fun moment, too. So uh, shout out to players being mic'd up. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, Brewers, again, a 5-1 and homestand in which they averaged just over six runs per game, even with a shutout in that mix. Here are some other numbers, too, with runners in scoring position. Brewers, for the overall homestand, hit 300 with runners in scoring position. And I've talked about it ad nauseum that they need to perform better with runners in scoring position. They need to give themselves more opportunities, and the timing will come. And, well, even yesterday, they relied on the home run ball. They only went 3 for 12 yesterday with runners in scoring position. And mind you, those 60 at-bats with runners in scoring position also includes a game in which they went 3 for 17 last Friday in extra innings with runners in scoring position. And they still hit 300 in risky situations. When you take out that Friday game, when you take out that 3 for 17 outlier, The Brewers hit 348 with runners in score position. They went 15 for 43. That's a good step in the right direction. Adam McCalvey had a piece in MLB.com talking about how the Brewers had a team meeting, but not a normal team meeting with the offense, with Connor Dawson, Ozzie Timmons, the assistant hitting coaches chatting about, hey, here's what happened last half. Here's what we can improve on. Here's what we did well. What's going to work moving forward? And it, it really seems like, as he put it in the headline, It set the tone for the weekend, and the guys also agreed on that, too, and also don't want to ignore Matt Erickson, also the infield coach and an assistant hitting coach, too. So the new guys, Connor Dawson and Ozzie Timmons, new to the organization. Matt Erickson was in Appleton for years. Now he's down here on the big league staff. So uh, good stuff there. I I really was, uh, I learned a lot from that uh, article from Adam McCalvey, and uh, if you listen to Brewers Unfiltered, I don't mind. They're really good. They have do a good job. Tim Dillard's a homie. McCalvey's a homie. Brad Ford's a homie. So it's all good. Uh, really good stuff there. And finally, let's start gushing about Corbin Burns. Another double-digit strikeout day for Corbin. 11 total. And it started out cold. Those first two innings were not great. The first nine batters had four hits against them, and you blink, and they're all of a sudden there are three runs on the board. Like, oh my gosh, this is going to be one of those days? Especially after Telez gave Burns a 3 0 lead after one inning. So you're thinking, oh man, what's going to happen? I sarcastically tweeted from the Lockdown Brewers account, oh, I'm sure uh, social media is going to react appropriately to Corbin Burns having a human start, right? <laughs> At first, they were not really reacting well, and then he kicked back into Corbin Burns mode. Uh, he gets 11 strikeouts, so that's his 20th career double digit strikeout game. He is now the third fastest starting pitcher ever to have 20 double-digit strikeout games. He did it in his 61st career start. Yes, I know he was a reliever. You're not going to get 10 strikeouts as a reliever. Uh, So 61st career game started. That's the third fastest. The only ones faster than him were Dwight Gooden. That's not a surprise. And you Darvish, but just barely. Darvish did it in 58 games when he first came up with the Texas Rangers. And for Burns to be on that list in 61 games is just a reminder of how short of a time that this has been clicking for him and makes it all the more impressive. And I think what was great, too, Mike Basalo, uh, director of team communications and public relations for the Brewers, also had another quick caveat on a good nugget as it pertains to Corbin Burns, is he didn't walk anybody yet again. Another great day for Corbin in which he doesn't yield a walk and has a ton of strikeouts. It's his eighth career start with double-digit Ks and zero walks and his second one this season. That dude's so good. That dude's so good. Uh, He had three whiffs, three swings and misses in the first nine batters he faced. He then got 14 swings and misses over the last 15 batters he faced. He clicked it back into gear. It felt like all 11 strikeouts were after the first time through the order. He did get two the first time through the order and then clicked it into gear. And a really fun strikeout was the fact that he got Luis Arise twice. Twice. Luis Arise has more walks than strikeouts still in his career. 
He still has never struck out three times in a game in his career. It was only the fourth time this year that Arise has struck out multiple times. And now, Corbin Burns joins Clayton Kershaw as the only pitchers this season to strike out Arise twice in the same game. And Kershaw, you may remember, back in April opening week, he had that perfect game going through six innings. And he struck out Arise twice in that game. And now Burns joins the list on that. That's cool company, too. Corbin Burns, I mean, I, I as of now, I don't think he's going to win the Cy Young if he had told me to guess right now, but he's going to be a finalist. He's going to be in the top three yet again, and maybe this is going to be something we're going to be really excited to watch for the next few years is how many times is Burns going to continue to be in the Cy Young conversation, going to be considered as one of the best in the biz. So fun stuff from Corbin again in this one. Enjoy it, man. I mean, the flow is sweet. The cutter is sweet. The curveball is working. Uh, he had as many whiffs on the curve as he did on the cutter. It's something new every night from Corbin, and uh, it's just an absolute treat to watch. Let's talk about the trade. Let's talk about Andrew Benintendi off the market. More on that in a second. So the outfield market took a shift yesterday. Andrew Benintendi was traded for by the New York Yankees, so he will leave Kansas City and go to the Yankees. Quick overall thought on this, too. As you may have remembered from last week, as vaccination status and going to Toronto is on the forefront of everybody's minds with the Cardinals, what they just had to do last week. Well, remember, the Royals had 10 players not eligible to cross the border and go to Toronto and play in that series, and Andrew Benintendi was one of them. And a lot of folks questioned, like, well, that impacts maybe American League teams don't want to get Benintendi now if he's staunch against getting vaccinated. Now it seems, according to reports from John Heyman and multiple other sources, that the Yankees never had vaccination status come up in the in the dialogue, and other sources say that Benintendi is willing to get the vaccine, which, I mean, they've got one more series head-to-head with Toronto, but if the playoffs started today and the Blue Jays won their wildcard series, they would match up with the Yankees in the ALDS. Now, mind you, the Yankees would have home field advantage, but if... The Blue Jays steal one game in Yankee Stadium. That means that Benintendi wouldn't have been eligible in game three and four and potential clinchers to lose that series. Now it sounds like that is not going to be the case, especially so because John Heyman also reported that Toronto was in the mix to acquire Andrew Benintendi, which I think tells you everything you need to know that, well, if Toronto was in, that means he was definitely willing to get vaccinated and it was a weird week of headlines, to say the least. And did you read that story about Johan Oviedo driving to Miami and, and getting his passport renewed because he's from Cuba and it was a whole thing? And he had to drive from Detroit to Toronto in order to make it to that series because he didn't feel like he wanted to let his team down. Uh, no comment added, but I thought that was a cool story. Let's talk about the trade and the outfield market. So three pitchers, minor league pitchers, were acquired for Andrew Benintendi. And when you talk to executives and when you talk to general managers and scouts, you hear the word, you hear the phrase anyway, well, the market needs to be set. What does that mean? The market needs to be set because, well, if Andrew Benintendi, a rental, is getting three minor league pitchers, none of which are really considered top prospects, they're considered good prospects, but not, you know, team's top 10, not a top by position or anything like that. That kind of tells you what to expect to maybe try to ask for and what to try to get moving forward. So outfield market for a rental is three minor league pitchers that none of which are can't miss prospects. That's for a rental. So when you look at the major names of the outfield market right now that you would consider trading for, and I'm excluding Brian Reynolds and Juan Soto from this because I don't think the Brewers have a shot at either one of those guys, but I digress. Ramon Laureano is not just a rental. He's got two more years of control. So if one guy's getting three pitchers, none of which is a slam dunk prospect, you would probably expect at least one slam dunk prospect or a big league player, controllable player, to the A's for Ramon Laureano because of those two extra years of control. And just a quick note, Soto also has two years of control, which is why the price is going to be so exorbitant if the Brewer or if the Nationals end up trading Soto here at the deadline or the next winter meetings, perhaps. Next up, Ian Happ actually has one more year of team control, but we saw all the hug fests and everything with him and William Contreras uh, over this past week as their last games at Wrigley as expected for the Cubs. Uh, He's still got one more year of team control. So, if again, if Benintendi brought in three minor league pitchers, 
none of which top prospects. You would expect Hap to at least bring in one top prospect, in my opinion. Uh, and also, quick side note, like it, Cubs, like Ricketts and everything, the Cubs should never be rebuilding. I'm sorry. I, 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 I still can't believe the Chicago Cubs fans are allowing them to rebuild in that city. Anyway, I thought that was, I think it's just really weird and that they're milking this Wilson Contreras and Ian Happ stuff like, oh, these guys are on the World Series team and all this. Blah, blah, blah. They should never be tanking. They're the freaking Cubs. They have the money to go get whoever they want. Anyway, I digress. Uh, Joey Gallo is a rental as well. Now, Joey Gallo is not the caliber player right now that Andrew Benintendi is. A lot of strikeouts, plays good defense, has big power, but a lot of strikeouts. He's a left-handed Keston Hira, if you ask me right now. Uh, Keston's probably a little better with the strike zone and strike zone awareness with walks, but Gallo is not going to charge, not going to be costing a lot. And perhaps after the trade deadline, if nobody wants Joey Gallo, he might be put through waivers. He might be put on, you know, DFA'd and released or whatever, and every team might have a chance at him because maybe teams are waiting out the Yankees, knowing that well they just acquired an outfielder. And they know they're not going to play Gallo while they have a left-handed hitting Andrew Benintendi. And they have Aaron Hicks already. And, of course, Judge is playing a lot of center field right now, too. Where does Gallo fit into this picture? So there's no rush for them to trade him now. Then they're probably going to have to release him, which means you won't have to give up anything to get Gallo. That's good news there, too. Uh, and finally, Trey Mancini, not technically an outfielder, but he has played a little bit of corner outfield. He play a lot of first base. He can be a DH. He's a rental with an asterisk. The reason why it's an asterisk is because there's a mutual option for next year worth $10 million, but there's a $250,000 buyout attached to his contract if he decides to test free agency this upcoming winter. That's currently with the Orioles. It's unclear if there's language in that contract saying that that option disappears if he's traded or if it becomes a, a, a team option or if it becomes a player option. I could not find that anywhere. So I would expect that option to remain in play. Uh, it's a mutual option, though, kind of like last year with Avisail Garcia. When he reached X number of plate appearances, it became from a team option to a mutual option. The Brewers wanted him back on the team deal. Garcia said, nope, see ya, I'm going to get my money. And now he went to the ginormous ballpark that is Marlins Park or Lone Depot Park and not able to hit the same power he hit in Milwaukee, which isn't surprising. That's a quick rundown of the outfield slash targeted market for the Brewers right now. So remember... Benintendi's a rental, and he got three minor leaguers. What will these guys call for, and how expensive will it be? In my opinion, Jackson Trurio is going to be untouchable. The way David Stearns talked about him on the air the other day on Valley Sports Wisconsin, he's untouchable. There's no way Jackson Trurio is going. The only way Jackson Trurio would be leaving the organization is for Juan Soto, in my opinion. But again, I don't think the Brewers are getting Juan Soto. Secondly... When you look at another untouchable, I think it's Joey Weimer. And, of course, last year's Robin Yacht Minor League Player of the Year. They want to see him develop. They want to see him healthy. They want to see him in AAA next year and maybe trying to knock down the door to make it to the big leagues at some point next season. I don't see Joey Weimer being traded either. But aside from that, I mean, I, I think they can get really creative. If they want to go for a big name, if they want to dangle a big fish, and try to get somebody that would really make a, a difference, a la Josh Bell. But, hey, Rowdy Telez just proved his worth this week. Uh, that was a, a fun day for him yesterday. Get ready. The stove's on. Starting The pan's starting to smoke. Let's add some oil and get cooking. This is it's going to be a fun few days heading up to the trade deadline. Uh, off day today. So, programming note. Tomorrow's episode, that's going to be a mailbag episode. So as you're listening right now, if you got questions, if you got thoughts, if you got comments, you got concerns, if you want to leave a review on it, whatever. Go ahead and tweet us at Locked On Brewers or myself at Dom underscore Catronio. I'll see them both. Got both accounts. At Locked On Brewers, just tweet us your question and I'll make it a whole day out of it. That'll be the entire episode tomorrow with the off day here today. Now, next, the Brewers head to Boston. Three game series with the Red Sox, who are scuffling right now. They lost to the Guardians yesterday, uh, seven to six, a late Josh Naylor homer. Uh, they will be playing again tonight at 610, so you can get a quick scouting report on the Red Sox. They are now under 500 again. They're 49-50 and 50 as they play game number 100 tonight and taking on the Cleveland Guardians. Pitching rotation, 610 on Friday night. It'll be Brandon Woodruff 
against Brian Bayo, a rookie right-hander for the Red Sox. Then Eric Lauer on Saturday, early start, 310 first pitch, central time, against Nick Pivetta. And then on Sunday, a 1235 first pitch with Aaron Ashby against Josh Winkowski, another rookie as well, and three righties. That's good news for the Brewers bats, getting ready to see the monster and getting ready to hear uh, Sweet Caroline and not planning on hearing Dirty Water. If you know, you know. Brewers win a fun one. They go 5-1 and one on the homestand, and this is going to be a fun week. The next time the Brewers come home, they could have some new toys. They could have a trade acquisition. Brewers go to Boston, then they go to Pittsburgh, and then they come back home next week. Uh, enjoy the weekend, and mailbag episode coming up tomorrow, and a lot to get to with the trades. Let's see if there's any more movement happening tomorrow after this Andrew Benintendi deal. I'm Dominic Catronio. Thank you for listening. Right back here tomorrow. Until then, keep on swinging. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.